Thank you everybody for showing up. Thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting Greenway Talks online. Please help me welcome our speaker for the morning, Dr. Manzi Sleewall, Professor of Astronomy at Caltech. <clears throat> Dr. Cass Sleewall's research group uses two robotic wide field infrared and optical survey cameras at Palomar Observatory as their primary discovery engines. With these, the team is working to map the infrared sky to record the transient infrared flashes that tell us about the life cycle of stars and to develop worldwide collaborations that allow astronomers to characterize discoveries across the electromagnetic spectrum. Having graduated from Cornell in 2004, a bachelor's degree in engineering, Manzi Kesliwal received <clears throat> a master's degree in astrophysics from Caltech in 2006. That before completing her PhD in astrophysics in 2011, also from Caltech. <clears throat> she then accepted a Hubble Fellowship and a Carnegie Princeton Fellowship at the Carnegie Institution for Science. Appointments she held until she joined the Caltech faculty in 2015. And as we were discussing earlier, I'm sure everybody knows, a few days ago, Professor S. Leewall and Caltech Professor Greg Hallinan were named as winners of a 2022 New Horizons Breakthrough Prize in Physics. Congrat congratulations, Professor. One personal note I must, must add, <clears throat> if I may, I should note that Nancy Kesliwal's young son, Viram, is a budding genius. Must, must run in the family. He's a budding genius because he has created a process to produce birthday cakes using 3D printing technology. Ooh, pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. Anyway, Professor Kesliwal. Welcome to the Greenway Talks online at Palomar Observatory. And thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. We'll take questions at the end of the presentation. So for now, I'm gonna ask everyone to turn off their microphones. And with that, Professor, please, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to uh, be here virtually to uh, share a little bit of my research excitement with you, as almost all of my research is, is closely connected to uh, Palomar Observatory and uh, enabled by the fantastic people and, and telescopes on that mountaintop. I was telling Steve just earlier that um, you know, we have to do this in person again because breathing the air and, and drinking the water at Palomar would make this even more fun. Um, but we could do it in a hybrid format so that we can still accommodate all time zones and, and anybody can join from anywhere. Um, so what I'd like to share with you today is, um, is literally the new horizon that um, uh, the Breakthrough Foundation has named, which is multi-messenger astrophysics. And the idea behind this new, hor new horizon definition is that we have multiple messengers by which we can study um, the most extreme events in our universe. So what you see um, in the background here are two neutron stars spiraling towards each other, these are extremely dense objects. And when they merge, they give out a burst of gravitational waves. A black hole is born, a jet is launched, a cocoon breaks out, and the entire electromagnetic spectrum is lit up. So we see all kinds of photons and gravitational waves from the same source in this fantastic event. 
And we saw this on August 17th, 2017. And it's just the beginning of this, this entirely new field with I, where I think the best is, is yet to come and, and that yet to come is in the next few years, in this coming decade. Um, so it's a very exciting field to be part of. And, and my goal for today is to share this excitement with all of you. Uh, so um, I'd like to begin with, um, with sharing what I think is like the biggest perk of my job at Caltech. Um, and that is the wonderful students and postdocs that I have a privilege of, um, of mentoring. And here are their beautiful smiling faces that, that inspire me to, to keep going, no matter what is happening um, on the news, which hasn't been, um, which hasn't been easy in the last, last couple of years. Um, all right, so let's get started. The outline for the talk is the three pieces. Uh, we'll begin with how we discover cosmic fireworks. Then after the discovery, how do we actually characterize them? How do we collect multi-wavelength data, multi-messenger data, wherever we can uh, uh, to understand more about what have we just discovered? And then finally, I mean, what does that tell us? What piece of the jigsaw puzzle of the mystery of the universe uh, does this tell us? You know, which chapter of the textbook gets, gets written here? Um, so I think, I hope all of you have been at Palomar Observatory. Um, so you, I hope you all know and love this, this, this gorgeous mountaintop. Um, and today, um, as, as all of you know, I mean, Palomar Observatory, and I hope you know, many of you have the, these mugs and, and mo the motto from George Ellery Hale, which is to make no small plans, dream no small dreams. And uh, when I came to Caltech, I mean, I took this, this very seriously. Um, and this is really embodied in the in not just the venerable 200 inch hail telescope, but the suite of robotic telescopes that that now surround it. They're very small telescopes, but the, the telescopes are really opening up um, a beautiful new window into what I like to describe as celestial cinematography. So these these smaller telescopes have these very wide field cameras that instead of just taking images of the sky, can make movies of the sky. The field of view is so large that we can image these large swaths of the sky over and over again. And by doing that, uh, we're able to discover uh, the dynamic universe, not just the static universe, but the mysteries of those fireworks that are energetic and ephemeral. They may last for a few, few hours or a few days in the you know, most optimistic cases, few weeks. And in that bright, luminous, short-lived flash of light, we can learn about uh, mystery of the universe. It's not accessible in any other way. So the two domes I'll take you inside um, today. One is the uh, Samuel Austin 48-inch um, uh, telescope dome, which houses the Zwicky Transient Facility Project, uh, named after Professor uh, Fritz Zwicky for his magnificent uh, achievements um, and discoveries over the decades. And the second one is a little tiny clamshell dome behind the 18 inch, um, which houses the Palomar Gatini IR project, um, which is a small project with, with a very wide field infrared uh, camera. And at the very end, I'll show you a glimpse of a new telescope, the newest telescope at Palomar Mountain. That's actually right as you enter that we just installed on in June of this year. So just a few months ago called the Winter Telescope. So we'll come back to the, the third dome actually as well. Um, so this Wiki Transient Facility is um, a wide field optical telescope um, where we have literally brought in the, brought the 48 inch uh, Schmidt telescope into the space age. It's, it's beautiful if you walk in there and you see what, what has been done. Um, so as uh, this, this used to be the telescope that undertook the Palomar Observatory sky surveys with photographic plates. Um, and now with the advances in semiconductor technology and Moore's law and the revolution that our friends in electrical engineering have brought about, um, we, we can afford um, the devices where the entire wafer is a chip. And if we take 16 of these wafer scale devices, we can get this mosaic, if you can see my cursor, that can fill the entire focal plane of the, of the 48 inch Schmidt telescope. So this beautiful focal plane, and you can look inside the belly of the telescope and three of the Caltech op Optical Observatory staff during the installation of this project. Um, here you can see the rest of the, the electronics just sort of attached to the bottom of the telescope here. Um, but what this telescope does for us 
is give us a field of view that is unprecedented and a sensitivity that's unprecedented. We get a field of view on sky of 47 square degrees, which is 230 full moons, right? So this is the, the full moon to scale, the Andromeda galaxy to scale. And the Andromeda galaxy is just one chip in, in the entire camera. And um, this is many fold faster than many other um, wide field optical cameras that are being built. Um, or uh, and some that are already decommissioned. And the predecessor of this Wiki Transient facility was the Palomar Transient Factory, uh, which was my, my thesis project here at Caltech when I was a student. And the way um, you convert this, this big camera into, into science is by learning subtraction all over again. Um, you know, my, my first grade uh, son um, claims he knows all that there is to know about subtraction. He doesn't realize how wrong he is because I had to learn subtraction all over again when I went to grad school at Caltech. So um, in this case, um, the idea is that we are subtracting images. We're taking images of the same sky night after night um, or even hour after hour when we do our highest cadence uh, sprints of the sky. Um, and then when we take these images, we subtract them. But before we subtract them, we need to convolve them, match the point spread function, correct for all kinds of um, effects of the atmosphere, like the seeing, uh, the transparency, um, match the astrometric photometric grids, and really do, a, do a, um, as best a job as we can to optimally subtract these images. Um, because we are now talking about a data volume where we cannot keep up with it manually, it's impossible. Um, the data volume is so large when we are trying to make these movies of the sky that the only way to keep up is by full automation, a very excellent you know, computing skills, data science skills. Um, and uh, so my students are all fluent in Python. Uh, that's a prerequisite of joining my group. And the only way to keep up is that every time you take an image, you instantly process it, you instantly flag using multi-stage machine learning what the new stars in, the, in those images are. What are new point sources that just did not exist even the night before? Um, and here's an example of a supernova in this beautiful uh, spiral galaxy um, that can be identified very nicely by subtraction. This galaxy doesn't change, but that, that supernova does um, in, the, in the course of a few nights. And so um, what this has yielded is more than 5,000 supernovae in just a couple, just since 2018, just in like three, less than three years. Um, and what you see here is uh, actually a movie of um, the supernovae where the red and the blue represent the two flavors of supernovae. So the um, red are white dwarf explosions and the blue are deaths of massive stars. Um, so these are the type one and type two uh, uh, classes of supernovae. But you can see as time goes on, Palomar is discovering supernovae um, in a magnitude limited or volume limited sense. And um, if I keep letting this, this movie play today, the number is more than 5,000 supernovae that are discovered and spectroscopically classified. Um, and many of these um, supernovae are spectroscopically classified actually by the Palomar 60 inch telescope. Um, using the, the robotic SED machine spectrograph that we have there. Um, and so this creates just this, this fantastic um, uh, juicy data set of um, understanding supernovae in, uh, at the very young phase, at the very fast phase, in the very rare categories. Um, and that's what this Wiki Transient facility has enabled. Um, and that's all in the optical, in the, in the visible light. Um, the visible light is where you know, we've, um, we have the, the sharpest tools, the best toys, and we've really been able to make leaps, progress in leap by leaps and bounds in the past, past few years. Um, the second telescope that I showed you at Palomar, the one in the, the clamshell dome, that is an infrared telescope. And you know, the first question you may ask me is, so why bother with the infrared? You know, almost everything about it is, is harder. You know, the night sky is so bright, the detectors are so expensive. Um, it's just a much, much harder place to work. So why bother with the infrared, all right? And um, I like to show this, this picture where you can see a somewhat in a boring looking piece of our galaxy and not very remarkable. When you look at it in the visible light, it just looks like a dark cloud. But if you take the same image in the infrared, you'll realize it's not boring at all. There's actually a protostellar jet um, that's hidden in there that 
just because of dust, just because the wavelength of light was not long enough and the visible to go around the dust was just hidden from our view. So if you want a full picture of what um, our universe has to offer, um, we do need to paint a panchromatic picture. And so um, with that motivation, um, but sort of limited by the, I mean, instead of this, this nice set of wide field optical detectors, in the infrared, the biggest infrared detector that anybody in the world had when I joined Caltech in 2015, um, was the European Vista project, which was in less than a square degree, the 0.6 square degree. And they talk about, they're talking about the wide field infrared space telescope, that's a quarter square degree. So even the one square degree mark was not broken, whereas in the optical, we were building this 50 square degree tool. So I wanted to know how we could make that leap in the infrared. And the answer to that was um, the Palmar Gattini IR project. Um, and that has a field of view of not 47, but 25 square degrees, which is still um, a pretty sizable factor of 40 jump from um, all the other infrared telescopes out there. So here you see a movie of um, uh, the infrared telescope in the clamshell dome. Um, this is a very small telescope. It's a 30 centimeter telescope with a very fast focal ratio. So this here is the entire telescope. That's just a baffle in front. And at the back of the telescope, we just have one detector. I mentioned to you, these detectors are very expensive. So we just put the detector, but behind such a fast uh, focal ratio that it subtends this very large angle on the sky. So we decided to break um, some new ground here by uh, taking on the challenge in software. Said, okay, if we can't have the pixels, we can't have the real estate in, in the focal plane. We'll try to solve this in, in software. So every pixel subtends nearly eight arc seconds on sky instead of the one arc second in the optical. And we use a technique called drizzle, where when we go to a point in the sky, we don't just take one image, but we take eight images uh, that are each about eight seconds long. And then because these images are drizzled, we're able to combine them and recover the spatial resolution entirely using um, innovative software algorithms. Um, and so every two nights, we're able to map 9,000 square degrees to a depth of about 16th magnitude in the infrared, in the J band at um, you know, one, just over one micron, 1.1 1, 1 micron. So that's how, I mean, these wide field telescopes, image subtraction, those are sort of the techniques by which we can discover new cosmic fireworks in the sky, um, either in the optical or the infrared. But part two is, okay, so what do we do once we find them? You know, all we know is there's a dot there, it's at this position and it's this bright. So how do we know what, what physics is hidden in that, that magnificent flash of light, right? How do we characterize them? And to do that, I had to make some friends um, uh, because it's not possible to do this alone because the sun does rise, the earth does rotate. Um, you know, jet lag is, is a fact of life here. Um, so uh, even if you discover the, the transient at Palomar, in order to characterize it, especially for things that are really fast moving or really young or just disappear in a few hours, we can't wait for the next sign at Palomar to characterize it. Instead, what we have to do is move west to the next, next beautiful mountaintop is Mauna Kea, uh, which has several nice telescopes for characterization. Then further west to Japan, Taiwan, India, Israel, Sweden. Olympics and Paralympic season is not too far away. So you can think of this as a relay race where we are passing the baton to these telescopes in a, in a ring around the world. And um, we were funded by the National Science Foundation in a partnership in international research and education precisely for this relay race called Growth. Um, and it was fantastic. It's just been a fantastic experience to work with um, this wonderful set of people and telescopes um, to try and collect this unprecedented data set right, where we have very nice time resolution on our time scales, and we can really start to complete the characterization of the data across multiple wavelengths in different time zones um, and uh, start to understand the astrophysics hidden in them. And it's really tools. I mean, I cannot emphasize, underemphasize the uh, data science that is necessary to make this possible. Um, we, that we have so many transients, so many events, and so many telescopes to coordinate that we just need to organize it. And we need to do this in an efficient way where we are doing systematic experiments. 
Um, so all of this goes into some central dynamic portal, um, which uh, in this case is a follow-up marshal. It's, it's basically a Facebook page <laughs> where this entire collaboration operates. And um, we just launched the next generation of the system. Uh, staff scientist Dima Duev at, uh, at Caltech um, came up with the system. And, um, and as inspired as he is by Professor Fritz Vicky, he calls this Fritz, even the Fritz is an acronym here. Um, and it's an open source uh, system on GitHub uh, that's been very well received by the astronomical community. It's very useful to all. Um, and what all of this enables is that uh, we are able to get spectroscopy, right? I mean, so not only do we figure out how the brightness of the transient is changing as a function of time, which we like to call the light curve, but we also get to take this light and disperse it through a prism or grism and be able to see the chemical thumbprint of the transient. Um, so here I'm just showing you some examples of, of spectra of different transients discovered by Palomar Catini IR in this case. Um, you see the optical spectra on the left, the infrared spectra on the right. All of these are actually obtained by the Palomar 200-inch telescope um, by the DBSP and triple spec instruments. And um, the DBSP instrument double beam spectrograph um, at, at Palomar is, is a force. Um, it's been around for decades. Um, and been, I mean, the most popular instrument on the, on the telescope. And um, what we are doing now is, is upgrading this to uh, an even more powerful uh, spectrograph, given how critical spectrograph is to uh, not just multi-messenger science, but many of the science areas um, that uh, the Palomar Observatory um, peop, uh, astronomy community uses. Um, and this beautiful new concept called the Next Generation Palomar Spectrograph is actually a four channel spectrograph where uh, there's an image slicer on top. So you can actually get incredibly high throughput, very high efficiency. You can tune your resolution and your slit width um, for doing these trade-offs. It will sit in the cast focus of the 200 inch telescope and um, its, it's progress is incredible on it. I think we should have it on sky in just over a year from now. Um, so despite the pandemic and the, the challenges, um, you know, the engineers have have you know, pushed forward on, on building this amazing um, uh, machine. And I think we're just, just over a year away from, from seeing first, first line. So this is again all about how do we then collect this incredible data set. So let's, let's now spend the rest of the time we have here on the astrophysics, on what we learn from these cosmic fireworks. Um, so let me go back to the beginning. Um, quick refresher on the life cycle of a star. Um, so the top is a sun-like star. Um, a sun-like star would, once it starts to run out of fuel, would expand to become a red giant and end up as a white dwarf. Um, a star that's say more than 10 times the mass of the sun, that's the definition of large here, would form a red supergiant and explode as a supernova. The supernova could have you know, three different remnants. You could either have a neutron star, which is incredibly dense. I mean, one teaspoon of a white dwarf was dense, it was 10,000 tons. One teaspoon of a neutron star is about 10 million tons. Um, and if that density is not high enough for you, you could you know, study the supernovae that form black holes and really see strong field gravity at its best. Um, or you could study the most extreme supernovae like the pulsational parent stability and the parent, parent stability supernovae where sometimes the remnant is just nothing. There's no remnant left behind at all. So now let's talk about each of these three um, fates of, um, uh, of stars and what fireworks that each of them produce. So let's begin with the, uh, with the white dwarfs. They are the most common variety, majority of the stars um, by you know, more, more than 95% by mass or number, however you do, do the math, um, end up as, as white dwarfs. And if the white dwarf has a companion, um, it can lead to some very interesting fireworks. Um, if you have two low mass stars merge, which happens all the time, the several hundred of these systems in our own Milky Way galaxy, um, you could find these white dwarf merger products that have these roller coaster like curves. You can see them you know, rise, dip by several hundred days, rise again. Um, and these are all light curves by the Palomar Gatini IR telescope. And what you see on the right is how this white dwarf merger is dredging up this large amount of dust. Um, from inside. And that's why it is causing these um, to, it to be hidden for a few hundred days and come back 
um, an increase in, in brightness by you know factor of several hundred here, right? Magnitude, the magnitude scale is logarithmic, um, but it's 2.5 times log base 10 of the flux. So uh, basically, a, um, five magnitudes here corresponds to a factor of 100 in, in flux and in intensity of what we are seeing here. Um, and in case you know, the white dwarf starts to get greedy and starts to steal too much material from its companion, um, then instead of just you know, variable star, um, you could have it completely explode. And if it completely obliterates the white dwarf, if it, it, it actually takes so much material that the thermonuclear runaway disintegrates the white dwarf, then you could get a type 1A e supernova. And that's what we've seen 3,000 plus examples of from the Zwicky transient facility. Um, if the white dwarf just steals a small amount of matter, instead of getting um, a supernova that is a billion times as bright as the sun, we can get a nova, which is about a few million times brightness of our sun. Um, and in our own Milky Way, Um, and that's really something that's enabled by um, the infrared eyes of Palomar Bettini IR. It's a small telescope, but it's just the field of view is so large that we can study the entire galaxy unhindered by dust. So I'm showing you again these examples of A minus B equals C, right? I mean, the image from tonight minus the reference equals the subtraction. And you see these really bright booming sources, which are classical novae in our own galaxy. They're not very fast, they're very easy to find because once they explode, then for 100 days, you see this really bright light from them, but it's very, very red. You can see it's 10th magnitude in the infrared and 18th magnitude in, um, in the G band and in C or in, or in B band for that matter. And here again, you know, you need the spectra to tell who's who and which ones are the novi. And what we are finding is that um, even though this was, you know, theoretically expected, seeing is, is believing here, um, we are finding that the novi, previously they would not make a lot of sense, right? Because if you take a view of our galaxy where we color, where the shading here is shading by mass, right? By how much, how much material there is, and that should be correspond to how many white dwarfs are there that could be stealing material from their companion and causing these, um, these fireworks to happen. Um, the uh, known classical novae were distributed all over the galaxy. And what we are finding now with, with Palmar Bettini IR is that they actually do trace the mass. There are more of them where there is more mass, right? Um, so this very simple um, discovery uh, solved a long-standing problem in this field of what the rate of classical novae are and do they actually trace the mass of the galaxy and and you know where you know this, this was uh, in the words of a Nova guru Bob Williams. Um, he'd often wondered about classical no, no, novae, like Fermi wondered about intelligent life. You now where are they? And our answer was they are they are there. They're extincted. We just need the infrared to find them, and and we found them. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, so I think you know basically if you if you make new new tools that can open up new parts of uh, open a new window into our universe. Um, we can solve some long-standing mysteries um, when we open up uh, th those eyes. Um, so now I'd like to transition to slightly higher densities. So we're going to dial up the density here and uh, talk about some fireworks, not on white dwarfs, but on neutron stars. Um, and for this, I'd like to, to take you back to August 17th, 2017. At precisely 12.41.04 UTC, cannot forget that date and time. It, it practically changed my life. <laughs> um, but in that moment, as I showed you right on that first slide, right? I mean, I, I have no qualms about saying that was my most favorite cosmic firework ever. Um, in that moment, the gravitational wave detectors in, in Hanford, Washington and Livingston, Louisiana, saw this magnificently long 100 second shirt. Now they detect like one part in 10 to the 22. So it doesn't look like there's really something there. You really have to like look carefully and you know do, do your match filtering very carefully. Um, and very importantly, the Virgo interferometer in Italy, even though it would be sensitive to such an event, did not detect this event. So this could tell us exactly where it happened. So even non-detections can sometimes be so important. It's, it's, um, it's um, you know, important to appreciate that about our universe. So, and about 1.7 seconds later, after this, this merger of these two neutron stars, 
um, that is that's shown by this white line here. There was a burst of gamma rays that was detected by the Fermi satellite and the integral satellite. So literally at 1241.04 UTC, there was the, the gravitational waves at 1241.06 UTC, there was already gamma rays. For the first time, we had light, which is photons and gravitational waves from the same source. And you know, this is the moment where you know, my phone rang, everybody in the growth collaboration woke up um, saying, you know, I think that you know, there is a new, two neutron stars that just happened to have merged and there is even a possible associated uh, gamma ray burst signal. And that's just the beginning of the fun in this uh, particular event. Uh, because what happened in the next few hours is that every astronomer pretty much dropped what they were doing and took their telescopes and started searching for more light from this, from this event. <clears throat> so neither the gravitational waves nor the gamma rays tell us where in the sky this happened, right? I mean, it was in this, it could be anywhere in this large area, anywhere in these um, 45 galaxies. And it took the optical and infrared telescopes to pinpoint that it was actually this, the home of this event was this, this particular S0 galaxy called NGC 4993 that was only 40 megaparsec away, right? So only 120 something um, million light years away. Um, and in this particular galaxy, NGC 4993, um, by pinpointing the home of the merger, set off entire networks of telescopes. So not just the growth network, I and mean, that was 17 telescopes worldwide, but 77 telescopes worldwide and about 3000 astronomers are looking at this point, this localization, of, of this um, first light from um, the birth of a black hole from two neutron stars merging. And over the next three weeks, we had the most exquisite data set um, from around the world, from, from many, many telescopes uh, contributing to um, the data. And you can see as time goes on, different telescopes are lighting up and contributing their, their photometry. And uh, the telescopes that you green is, see in green here uh, can collect data in the day, and I'll let you guess which wavelength uh, that data is at. Um, but in about three weeks, uh, this event was at 13 hours right ascension in the middle of August, right? So it was really in the wrong part of the sky and very close to the sun. And we had to stop our observing campaign uh, in about three weeks, and it faded so quickly that really it was getting very challenging uh, towards the end of that three weeks to collect data on this event. Um, but what we did in those, in those um, first few weeks was um, uh, stay up all night to collect data and then stay up all day to write the papers and understand what all of this means. So not, not sleep very much at all. Um, and it was amazing, actually. And the data set was just, just exquisite. And what we found and was that we were actually seeing literally red-handed half the elements in the periodic table, heavier than iron, being synthesized. So I spoke about supernovae before, right? Supernovae make elements, the lighter elements that are shown in light blue or dark blue, depending on which flavor of supernova you're talking about. But everything you see in yellow here, right? That is something that comes from, um, sub, uh, from rapid capture of free neutrons, the R process nucleosynthesis, which until 2017, we had many ideas of where they could happen, but we hadn't actually seen it happen. And in this particular example, with the, the data set that we had, we saw a very bright blue flash. The blue is again, these are again light curves, so intensity as a function of time. We saw these very br bright blue things fade in the ultraviolet in a few hours, um, in the optical for you know, a few days, but in the infrared for several weeks. So we saw something rapidly redden. And this really was, was the clue that what was happening here could not be explained by uh, ion group elements, could not be explained by lighter elements. This is something where uh, the photons are having such a tough time escaping because they're getting distracted. They, are, they have to be getting distracted by elements where, which are very, very heavy, where there are many, many possible line transitions. So they're just sort of bumping around electrons in, in all kinds of random energy levels because there's so many of them, such that by the time they escape, it's the, the whole um, emission is very opaque and brightest in the infrared. So this rapid reddening and this infrared bright event that we saw, um, the only way to explain it was that we were actually seeing our process happen. Um, and furthermore, if you look at all the spectra and here, I'm showing a lovely collage by my collaborator, 
Elena Pian from the VLT telescope, um, you can see on all these bumps and wiggles that the only way to really explain them is by um, invoking elements like neodymium and lanthanides. And I mean, there's still debate on exactly which one, right? I mean, because there are 130 possibilities um, in um, elements that could be synthesized by the R process. Um, and so to this day, there are debates on exactly what each of these bumps and wiggles represent. Um, but there's no question and you know, agreement across the astronomical community that heavy elements were synthesized in this, in this merger. And, and not by a small amount, there was something like 10,000 Earth masses of heavy elements synthesized. So that's not small. <laughs> and it was just, just spectacular to see this. Um, but the debate is, you know, which ones, right? So as I was telling you that these, it's a little complicated, but the relative fractions of these elements is very different in our solar neighborhood. And we wanted to know whether or not this matches what these neutron stars mergers produce. Are they one of the sites of our process nuclear synthesis or are they the one and only site, right? Um, so those are sort of the questions we are, we are grappling with right now. Um, and some, in, in my mind, you know, one of the most important question is, did we make some heavy elements uh, or did we make the heaviest of the heavy elements? If I go back to the periodic table here, um, if, you, if you look at say the lanthanides, right? I mean, they're down here. Um, if you look for silver, it's up here. If you look for gold and platinum, uh, they are um, here, right? In the, in the periodic table. So the question is, did we get to that third peak? Did we get to the heaviest of the heavy elements in, um, in that 10,000 Earth masses? Was there even 10 Earth masses of gold and platinum, right? I mean, uh, this was something that was of great interest to you know, my parents and that was an element they actually recognized. Neodymium and lanthanide didn't care, lanthanum didn't care too much for, <laughs> but they wanted to know whether the heaviest of the heavy elements were actually made here. And um, uh, what we found with this um, image that I was showing you here from the Spitzer Space Telescope is that in fact, even 43 days and 74 days after merger, there was definitely some emission here and possibly you know, at three sigma levels of emission here. And these two data points are, some, are right now our only clue as to whether we actually did strike gold because these heaviest elements have the longest radioactive half-lives so they can stay bright for long enough if you look in the red enough wave bands here. And this is now four and a half microns um, that we are looking at. Um, so, uh, so there's a hint that maybe we actually did synthesize all of these elements, but I would say it's still an open question. And in fact, I mean, if you really try to squeeze out as much information as you possibly can from those two data points, um, uh, we can narrow it down to about eight elements that are dominating the emission based on how much light there is and what their half-lives are. Okay, um, so changing gears for the third time, um, I want to, want to go dial up the density even more and just take the last few minutes to talk about some fireworks that involve black holes even before uh, in the merger process. So neutron star black hole mergers, black hole black hole mergers. Um, and as we all, um, I hope I've heard of, right? I mean, on September 14th, 2015, um, we detected the merger of um, two very massive black holes. These are about 30 solar mass black holes. And um, when these two black holes merged, they emitted a loud signal of gravitational waves. Now, instead of a 100 second signal, that was only a you know, three second signal. Um, but yet in this merger of two, two black holes, about three solar masses times C square of energy was converted to gravitational waves. Um, and this amazing um, feat, which was you know, many decades in the making and that several thousand physicists working really hard to, for, to make you know, impossible, seemingly impossible detections possible, um, led to the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics um, uh, to uh, my very senior colleagues at Caltech, Barry Barish, uh, and Kip Thorne, and of course, MIT professor um, Ray Weiss. Um, but black holes, when they merge, um, they're amazing. They, they lead to Nobel Prizes, but they don't do as much justice to the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so while I was super excited, this was you know, two weeks after I joined Caltech uh, that this happened. And I mean, it was certainly a, a fantastic start <laughs> to, to, be, to see this, this scientific revolution happen in, my, in front of my own eyes. 
um, I was waiting for there to be again, you know, some neutron stars in the mix, right? And that the two neutron stars had to wait till 2017. Um, and I just told you about that. But what happens if you have one of each, right? If you have one neutron star and one black hole, what happens if they merge? Do they even exist? And um, this was a question that um, until 2019, right? So we went 2015, two black holes, 2017, two neutron stars, and 2019, a neutron star plus a black hole. And neutron star plus black hole, honestly, it was completely a, um, a figment of imagination before 2019, because we don't have any astrophysical probe of such a system, right? We can't see them in, in, independently in the X-rays or at any other wavelength or in the radio, or any other, there's no other form of emission that we've been able to track down these events. Yet in the most recent, the third observing run of um, the gravitational wave observatories, they found a few examples, um, at least three, and maybe a few more that are still in the works um, of neutron star black hole mergers. And it was amazing because if this happens, then uh, theoretically, if the neutron star comes close to the black hole, um, it could get shredded so, far, so much that you could get an even more bright um, infrared signal because you could produce, definitely produce the heaviest of the heavy elements in much, much larger quantities. So it wouldn't be so difficult to tell as we saw with the two neutron stars, whether they are good factories for the heaviest of the heavy elements that should be in your face um, with these events. So um, my team got very excited about these neutron star black hole merger discoveries. And every time there was one, we uh, looked at it with the Zwicky transient facility, with Palomar Gattini IR, with any telescope we could get our hands on, the dark energy camera uh, telescope at the CTIO four meter. Uh, to try to look for the light associated with these neutron star black hole mergers. And what we found, despite every time we looked, was that in these you know, three or more cases, um, was that there was just nothing there. Um, and we had you know, mapped this however we could, you know, with every time zone, within a few hours, within 14 hours, within 20 hours. Um, in fact, for an event that happened on August 14th, 2019, uh, the localization was very good. It was as good as for the August 17th, 2017 event two years ago. So if there was some light, like there was for the gravitational wave event in August 17, 2017, we would have seen it, but we could rule it out, right? Because, you know, these brave postdocs in my group, Igor and Danny, they, they looked at the data forwards, backwards, and sideways and didn't see anything there. And the same data set was analyzed by different groups of scientists, and there's just nothing there, no matter how hard we looked. So um, I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. So the only thing that we were left with is that um, if there's really, really nothing there, then could the neutron star be swallowed whole by the black hole? So maybe there was no light when a neutron star merges with a black hole. And um, that could happen. In fact, for that particular August uh, 14, 2019 event, um, on that day, the, the neutron star was only about, um, you know, a couple of solar masses, about three solar masses, actually, to be precise, but the black hole was 20 solar masses. So it was just much, much bigger than the neutron star. So in this situation, because we have a very extreme mass ratio, that's this Q parameter, there's a lot of po possibilities for completely black, right? You get wiped out because the black hole just, just eats up the the neutron star in one fell swoop. But in the rest of the possibilities, right, if you have lower mass ratios, if depending on how, you know, how quickly the black hole is spinning, what the composition of the neutron star is, in most cases, you know, you still expect to see a very, very red source that rapidly reddens, right? So even though the first, you know, three events here, it's been a bit um, discouraging because it seems like the black hole is just eating it up. Um, I think it, it just means that the, the problem is harder. Maybe we're not going red enough to actually detect um, the emission. Um, so chasing after this very red emission, um, the Gatini telescope, as I mentioned to you, is fantastic in terms of its large field of view, but it's limited in terms of its sensitivity because the aperture of the telescope is only 30 centimeters. So to look for this ubiquitous, luminous, and long-lived emission, I've been working on sort of the next generation of infrared surveyors. 
And just in June of 2021, just a couple of months ago, um, uh, right after you know the first time that Andy let us go to Palomar, <laughs> we <laughs> installed the a new telescope called the Winter Telescope. Um, and this Winter Telescope is a one meter telescope um, that is inside this room. You can see the 200 inch at the back actually, um, but we were able to install, successfully install the, the telescope. Um, the, cam the infrared camera is not yet ready. That's something we're still building in the lab. Um, we are hoping for the sensors to get de delivered any day. So we, we might be just a few months away from being able to get a sensitive enough wide field infrared telescope at Palomar um, Observatory to be able to look for this neutron star black hole merger emission. Um, and at the same time as we are doing this, my um, collaborators on the Gatini project, uh, Professor Anna Moore and Tony Chevalion um, at Australian National University, they secured a grant to build a sister telescope uh, to winter called DREAMS in, at Siding Springs Observatory in Australia. Um, and it's just fantastic. I mean, they haven't, um, they're also delayed by the pandemic, right? And all of Australia is in lockdown. Um, but we're hoping by early next year, early 2022, they'll have this, this um, second sister telescope, which is at a perfectly you know, um, complementary longitude and latitude for us uh, to us so that we can get good coverage of the, of the event when it happens. And you know, weather can't play spoils board, the declination cannot play spoils board, the sun cannot play spoils board, <laughs> um, and we can have some fun here. All right, I do want to save time for questions. I'm gonna end with one thought on you know what next um, you know um, what if we need even more sensitivity than we can afford with winter and dream you know what is my dream um, infrared surveyor here um, and that is something that um, I'd like to take you for a moment all the way down south uh, to Antarctica and to Dome C and if you're interested in in this dream I just attended and uh, participated in the SCAR 2021 conference on Antarctic science Antarctica is actually a really special place um, because um, you know we can use this really new technology that's being developed, um, especially in terms of detectors that are sensitive and a very high quantum efficiency at longer wavelength, like beyond two microns. And this beautiful um, optic optothermal concept called cryoscope that Roger Smith at Caltech is is has is developing, uh, which is a fully cryogenic system. Telescope plus detectors, all all cold. Um, and if you combine these two, these two new technologies and you take it to Antarctica, where the sky is a factor of 40 darker, right in the same K-dark bandpass, just above two micron, and the seeing is a quarter arc second, right? If you get 30 meters above the ground, if you can <laughs> beat the ground there, um, then you could get a dream machine for the infrared because you would be able to find neutron star black hole mergers all the way out to 400 megaparsec. So with that dream in mind, uh, I'd like to you know, stop here and take some questions from all of you. Thank you. Professor Cass Leewall, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. And thank you for communicating, so, so, so wonderfully communicating the excitement of discovery and participation in science. Thank you. Thank you very much and open the floor to questions, please. <laughs> oh, I'm embarrassed. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll ask one. Please. Um, you, you said you had like 5,600 supernova, which is a lot. And you, you mentioned, but did not go farther than mention, um, really exotic supernova, like, for instance, the pair instability supernova. And that's enough to have like meaningful statistics. Did you confirm any pair instability supernova in that bunch? That's a fantastic question. And let me say out of those 5,000 supernovae, only 100 supernovae are in what I would describe as not, not just luminous, but super luminous category, right? So they're not just a billion times the brightness of the sun, but like 10 billion times the brightness of the sun. Um, and we just crossed the 100 mark um, on the study of super luminous supernovae, which are the prime candidates for parent stability <laughs> supernovae. 
And there's intense debate on, you know, what the nature of these hundred supernovae are, could they, or superluminous supernovae are. Uh, some people are debating that, you know, some significant fraction of them come from magnetars, which are um, neutron stars, which have magnetic fields of 10 to the 15 Gauss instead of 10 to the 12 Gauss, right? So a thousand times more magnetic. Um, some people claim that um, not all hundred, but maybe about 10 um, are prime candidates for parent stability, where you end up with no remnant at all. And the way they argue that is that if you look at the, the data that we have, it has a very long rise to peak. And it produces a heck lot of nickel. Like, I mean, it produces like five solar masses of nickel and nearly like tens of solar masses of ejector. So the star itself had to be like more than 100 solar masses to actually even explode in this very, very luminous and very, very long lived light curve. So I would say there's not, um, um, there's not slam dunk evidence as in there isn't one event for which the entire community is like, this is it. Um, and there's no other model, there's no other way to explain it except um, parent stability. But there are about 10 cases where I think there's a very compelling um, uh, data set that suggests that this, this does happen. Um, and the real proof of it would be if we could, um, uh, if we could see and, um, this happened somewhere, it, it happens so rarely, it's very difficult, but if we could see it happen in our backyard and in our local universe, and we could nail that there really is nothing there uh, to very deep limits, I think that would be that would be compelling, but we'd have to wait a long time before we see one of these in our backyard. Right now, the 10 events that we have are a little bit further away, um, so we can't um, um, confidently tell with no, no shadow of doubt that there is nothing there. Uh, but they're quite compelling. So I think the, the search goes on. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. In terms of the uh, observatory, an IR observatory in the South Pole in Antarctica, mm -hmm. this dome C, how close are you to uh, putting that up and getting it into operation? Oh, a very first step. <laughs> uh, okay. Just at the point where um, you know we have a concept. Te technically, it's very feasible. Uh, we are starting to get the community excited about it, building up the community. We have to raise the funds for it. It's not. It's an expensive project. Uh, the and Antarctica is not an easy place to get to. <laughs> um, and um, so I would say we are probably. If all goes well, if all goes per plan, and somebody write, does write us that check, uh, then I'd say we're five years out. Five is from the location. Is there a station there already? Like there yes. is at the South Pole for UCSD's telescope. Yes, yes. So there's a French Italian base, um, so they have the necessary infrastructure, and we have some collaborators in France and Italy that are quite excited about this project. Uh, so it would be a you know sort of uh, there'd be at least four countries involved, which is the U.S., France, Italy, and Australia, in this in this project. Thank you. So if they build it, will you go to Antarctica yourself? We will assemble everything, build it, build it here, and then ship it to to Antarctica. And um, and we first, I mean, the South Pole would be much easier because actually the National Science Foundation is a really nice space with a lot of infrastructure in place, mm -hmm. but the seeing is not as good. So we can't get that quarter arc second seeing. The ground layer is just too high. We'd have to go like a hundred meters up mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to do that. Um, so that's why we are leaning towards going to, to Dome C, which is a little bit harder in terms of the infrastructure, but, um, but it really can do science like nowhere else. And, and at the same telescope, we want to launch it into space. The, the budget would be more than a factor of you know, 100 or a few more zeros in that budget. I don't know exactly how many, but and a few more years. And you know, instead of five years, you'd be talking about 15 or 20 years, which is a long wait. So, um, and it's just quite amazing, actually, that we can get space-like sensitivity from the ground. And the only thing we have to do is, is go far south to beat that in that particular band pass at 2.25 micron. Professor, I'm a little curious about the, your, your detectors go out to about two and a half microns. Um, I'm yeah. curious what the detector technology is that you're using and, and uh, how much you cool them. Yeah, um, that's a great question. It's actually molecular beam be methotaxy on silicon. Um, these are detectors that um, Don Feiger is de developing at the Rochester Institute of Technology. 
and the quantum efficiency curve that I showed you that was at about 70 Kelvin. So we don't need to do, go too cold. Actually, it's you know, I mean, it is it can be cryo cooled to very satisfactory um, uh, levels, so that that doesn't require any maintenance, right? Because we make these fully robotic systems, so we don't want to be going and filling in the liquid nitrogen or any such thing, right? We want it to be a completely um, self-sufficient unit that can op operate robotically um, all night. Um, and in Antarctica, all night in the winter means 24 seven, right? For six months <laughs> because of the location. Um, so yeah, but the detector, and it, it honestly, it was just a few days ago that um, uh, Don uh, Feiger received these detectors in his lab and measured these QE curves. Earlier, he only could get that 95% quantum efficiency to two micron. And he's just been able to push it to uh, two, uh, two and a half um, in this newest batch of detectors that he got in his lab just a few, just a few days ago. <laughs> so just earlier this month. Uh, so it's very exciting. So, uh, so we and this was sort of the um, the these two technologies, right? The, the fully cryogenic technology that's being developed at Caltech by Roger Smith, and this, these detectors that Don Feiger are developing. These two technologies have to be proven before we can go to the next step of of uh, conceptualizing the, the full system. Thank you. And please, please call me Mansi. I'm professor's too, too, too big a word. Mansi. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Somebody? <laughs> Anybody? Okay. <laughs> I'd like to ask one if I might. Um, in acknowledging the New Horizons Breakthrough Prize, you wrote that mentoring students and postdocs is the biggest perk of my job. <laughs> okay. Very true. <laughs> um, as, as, you, as, as you went through your education, your training, um, first at Cornell and then at Caltech, <clears throat> did, you have, did you have a mentor that a person that was particularly important, particularly critical to your success? Definitely. I mean, I don't think I would be here today if I wasn't uh, lucky enough to work with some really fantastic people. At, at Cornell, it was Professor Jim Haug and Professor Richard Lovelace. Um, at Caltech, my PhD advisors, Professor Sri Kulkarni. In fact, I mean, um, I was working on, you know, weak lensing and observational cosmology in my first year at Caltech. And it was a drive to Palomar um, with Professor Sri Kulkarni that, that really convinced me to do uh, time domain astronomy. And that's that first trip to Palomar is where I fell in love with the telescopes, right? And, and realized that, oh my God, this is like, this is something that we could just have so, so much fun with. And um, and this is something I can stay up all night for, right? I mean, this is this will keep me up at night. <laughs> and uh, I'd like so we're Professor, doing tonight. yes, <laughs> actually, I'm in <laughs> India right now, and it's twelve thirty-five a.m. So if I sound a little sleepy, you know why. <laughs> um, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, as an astronomer, I mean, day or night, you 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 do you do things when when you have to here. Uh, but Professor Kulkarni, he is he was a director of Caltech Optical Observatories for almost a decade. Um, and he really has been a, a guru to me, a mentor to me in, in many ways. Um, and uh, you know, I have many, many stories. Um, I can roast and toast him um, <laughs> for hours here, but um, I'm very grateful to him um, for um, all the mentorship over the years. Well, thank, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much for that. That's, that's, that's wonderful to know that mm -hmm. background, that. Um, I think Andy uh, was saying something, Steve. I thought yeah. this. I think Andy was asking a question, but we don't hear you, Andy. So we see you talk, but we don't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I <laughs> saw him see so move his lips, but I didn't hear anything. So I just want to make sure you're, you're not yeah. muted, but you're not getting any voice either. 
Yeah, microphone. Yeah, so it's on. a new feature with a new microphone. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. um, now we can. I can ask this question anytime, but since we've gone to the trouble of embarrassing me publicly, <laughs> I'll go ahead and ask it now. Um, so we have the one event, 1708-17, the two mm -hmm. white dwarf uh, merger and the suggestion that. of the, um, I'm sorry, neutron star, yes, sorry. Uh, and the suggestion that basically all of the r -process, process elements are created um, mm -hmm. in that event. How many more of those events, I guess what I'm trying to say is how much uncertainty is there in the R process production mechanism and how many more of those events will we need to nail down a higher degree of confidence in mm -hmm. how that material is synthesized in the periodic table? That's a, that's a fantastic question, Andy. I'd say the answer is about 10. Um, I think we need to go from one to 10. And in that 10, I think we, we want to see you know, what the diversity is. Is it only two neutron stars that do this? Is it also neutron star black holes, as long as they have a low enough you know, mass ratio that do this? Um, what type of galaxies do they form in? Are they as bright as, as GW170817, that first event was? Um, each time, or are they actually fainter, which means they produce less amounts, right? Because we need about um, uh, one event per you know, 10,000 years per galaxy at that rate, and 10,000 Earth masses to explain the, our process material that we see around us. And it's hard to get either of those numbers unless you have a sample of at least 10, right? You can't tell the rate <laughs> very well, right. but one event, right. and you can't tell the quantity of material um, with just one event. But I think with 10 events, we'll start to get really close to the answer. Okay. And then we'll be fussing over the details, right? Is it which elements and what proportion, Earth side, the Earth side? Um, then it'll be more, you know, figuring out the details. Um, but um, I think until we go from one to 10, each one will be, uh, you know, life changing for, <laughs> for whoever's involved in staying up all night. <laughs> Well, and, it, it does sound like an excellent job security. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> like <Right>. pulling acknowledged. <laughs> it's been quite a long time, uh, but if I recall correctly, the graduate students and postdocs have rather short term time horizons for their research. How do you motivate graduate students and postdocs to work on something that has a a five-year, a 10-year time horizon. How do you motivate the people to work on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's difficult, um, uh, you know, and, uh, but somehow, I mean, the flavor of students that we get at Caltech, they are willing to um, do these sort of high-risk, high-gain projects. They are somehow willing to sign up for projects where you know, there is no guarantee that there will be an answer at the end of the, the five years, but at the same time, um, there's just so much more science in that journey, right? I mean, so even if they don't find that neutrons are neutron star merger that they set out to look for, there'll be all kinds of other explosions, cosmic explosions and fireworks for them to study and analyze and, and make progress towards their thesis. Um, so they may sign up for this crazy idea, this crazy dream as plan A, but they have a plan B that will help allow them to graduate in five years and not spend all their life in grad school, which would be horrible. <laughs> so, um, and it, it requires, I think, uh, you're absolutely right, Mike. I mean, it requires a certain type of person that is um, willing to take, take, take a risk, right? I mean, take that, um, take that jump and, and keep the eyes open, right? I mean, I, when I was doing my own thesis, the Palma Transient Factory was actually plan D in my thesis. I mean, I went through A, B, and C with null results. <laughs> but, but, um, it, but somehow I kept going, which was um, thanks to a very supportive family. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's something where, you know, I think the students do have the character of not giving up, being persistent, just keeping their eyes open. You know, they went looking for, for plan A, they might find something else along the way, which is very exciting too. Um, and, uh, you know, write those up as scientific publications to help them graduate. But and you're I absolutely assume, right, it's not easy. I assume you're creating some sort of an archive that people can sort of comb through afterwards and, and look for other things other than what might have been the primary goal for making that archive. Is, 
Is that all kind of sort of automatically done these days and archived like that? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, in real time. So with this Wiki Transient Facility, uh, thanks to funding from the National Science Foundation, it's a, it's a, every, like literally we take the image seven minutes later, we'll publicly announce all possible candidates in that image that could be new. Now, we definitely don't have the appetite to study 100,000 alerts a night, right? I mean, and make sense of them or understand them, but we just put them out there in a very nice format that the wider astronomical community can digest, understand, study their own piece. And we are seeing the fruits of that. We are seeing people who have nothing to do with the project, right? I mean, are not part of the, the core group building the project or enabling the project, but doing great science with this data that we are just putting out there in an easily accessible format and um, in real time, not even as, oh, we'll do that a year later or you know, when, we, when we get time. But in real time, we're just putting out this information and um, sending it out and seeing science happen by a wide I, community of, of users across the world. Can you say a little bit more about this growth collaboration? It seems like a very impressive coverage and it seems to work very rapidly. How did it get organized and how does it work? Uh, I, I mean, honestly, it was, it's as much a, a group of friends, a network of people as telescopes. The telescopes in there are actually very heterogeneous. They are very different in terms of their um, capabilities, the instruments, the apertures. Um, what they can do, but uh, the astronomers in that, in that group are very like-minded. Um, and you know, when I put together this proposal for the National Science Foundation, um, I think everybody who was part of this believed that this was a very long shot. And it's uh, very unlikely that NSF will actually support something um, like this, because it was before the detection of gravitational waves. And we were promising not only detection of gravitational waves, but also light associated with it. And most people thought that was impossible when we <laughs> wrote the proposal back in 2015. Um, so I, I think that um, the, uh, we're very grateful for um, what um, uh, the, the funding that we had to organize the collaboration and so that everybody could have students, postdocs involved and, and their telescopes funded to a level where we can collaborate very efficiently and effectively. Um, but it's not um, a sort of ground up plan where you, know, you deploy identical telescopes, they're all in a homogenous network, all you know, very efficient or anything. It's actually a very heterogeneous group of telescopes and um, but just a very solid group of people that are all sort of excited about the same science and want to see it happen. And we've had a lot of fun over the last five years doing this. So it's sort of a coalition of the willing with strong leadership. <laughs> yeah, just friends. Yeah. <laughs> coalition of adventurous friends. And several <laughs> of them actually have Caltech connections. Some are friends from grad school, some friends from postdoc days. <laughs> now, I might have missed it, but where, where physically on Palomar, uh, on the Palomar campus, is the uh, IR Gattini telescope? Just behind the 18 inch. Behind the 18 inch. Dome, yeah. In a small clamshell dome. And the winter telescope is right as you enter, even before you get to the 200 inch on the right. Uh, Mike Brown had a telescope in that dome, um, I think a decade ago, and he kindly let us uh, take that dome, refurbish it, and uh, now use it for the winter telescope. Uh -huh. And it's, yeah, I mean, the Palmer staff that. have done an awesome job refurbishing it. It's brand new. <laughs> Hmm? All right. Uh, if you uh, walk off toward the uh, or head off toward the 60 inch, you'll come to a point where on the left side you have the uh, 18 inch dome, and on the right side you have this clamshell. Uh huh. If we're ever allowed up onto the mountain again. <laughs> if we, yeah, if. Yeah. Andy, that's uh, I'm, sure Andy, I'm sure Andy will allow us up onto the mountain <laughs> sometime in the future. Someday, someday, someday. <laughs> Just never leave. Uh, I'm sorry, home. Mike, your your audio is breaking up. I can't quite make up what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> As I recall, a typical clamshell dome, you know, opens this way, and the one we have next to the 60 inch of Mount Wilson 
cannot look at the zenith. So if you've got the research telescope in the clamshell dome and you can't look at the zenith, isn't that kind of a problem or does the dome open in some other way? Yeah, no, no, it's not, not, not quite I mean, a clamshell. Actually, I think, I, I think some people on the mountain like to call it the doghouse dome because yeah, it just there, opens completely. So there's there no is a historical <laughs> designation for this building and it is not clamshell. <laughs> the dog house because literally yes, the entire is. Room is gone. I, I, so when I started coming to Palomar, it was called the dog house, and <laughs> that's what I know it as. <laughs> okay. But yes, you can see the zenith. Yes, no Good. problem. <laughs> Good. Other things, other questions, anybody? Nobody wants to embarrass Andy again. <laughs> my my finger is just kind of itching over the leave button so <laughs> great I'm talk Monty. thank you so much very good well can i can i i guess conclude with with a question a little bit a little bit different subject but a couple of days before the announcement of the breakthrough prize caltech had another announcement um, that came out concerning, well, the title of the announcement is a black hole triggers a premature supernova. And uh, Professor Kassliwa, your name, your name is co-author for the paper on that. Can you tell us a little bit about this discovery of a new type of supernova? <clears throat> So this is a paper by Dylan Dong, who's a graduate student working with Professor Greg Hallinan at Caltech. Um, it's, so just like we're trying to, you know, sort of open up the infrared sky, and you heard, heard that, that uh, today, the radio sky, the dynamic radio sky. And what Dylan found was this fascinating transient that just did not make any sense at all. And um, I mean, I think he picked every person's brain he possibly could to try to figure out what it is. And the only way we can, we can make sense of it is actually that some sort of merger, right? Some sort of compact object merger where the strong gravity involved triggered a premature supernova. Because it doesn't look like a supernova. It doesn't look like a, like a merger. It, it looks like something else. But I would say that's just a wild guess right now. Um, it's a pretty cool one, um, and you know Dylan is determined to find more of these events. They're very rare, and um, just like we are seeing surprises you know, on the path when we build these uh, systems for um, opening up time domain at different wavelengths, the radio is another one, and especially things that are happening at Avon's Valley Radio Observatory and uh, at Socorro, New Mexico, the very large array. These are going to be game changers, um, and you'll hear more of these things that we couldn't even imagine before, but the data is telling us that's, that's what's happening. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have to um, um, open up and broaden our imagination as we build these magnificent time domain machines. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for this presentation. Thank you for the discussion. Um, thank you. Thank you for the insight on science and discovery and the whole culture of how this gets done. Um, Thank very, you. Very, very impressive and, and, and very refreshing. So Thank with that, you. let me conclude with a word about our next meeting. The Greenway Talks will continue on Saturday, September 25th, and Dr. Douglas Leonard Associate Sorry. Professor of Astronomy at San Diego State University to speak with us on the subject of supernova, surprise, geometry, the geometry of their explosions and the nature of their progenitor stars. His presentation is titled, So When Will Betelgeuse Explode? <laughs> Not and tomorrow. <laughs> you know, you never know. Um, and with that, let me also do a sneak preview on something a little farther out in the schedule. Our last meeting of the year 
will be on Saturday, September 18th. And I hope everyone will participate. I hope everyone will join the conversation on that day when we will have a, a discussion with our guest, the senior editor of Sky and Telescope Magazine, J. Kelly Beatty. We'll have a little different format. We'll be doing a, not really an interview, but a conversation. And everybody is welcome to join that. Something to look forward to, something I am certainly looking forward to. And As the scheduled date for the launch of the JWST. It's right now it's supposed to go on December 18th. Yes, I heard it was pushed back and uh, we, ha we have a presentation on James Webb coming up as well uh, in October, I believe. Hmm. So, uh, Professor Kessliwall, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for supporting the Greenway Talks. A wonderful session. And with that, I will end the meeting and we'll see you in two weeks. Everybody wave. Thanks everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs>